I mean, I did all of it, but you know, I just obeyed anyway. But today we're going to talk, we're going to continue six weeks. We're six weeks into our series, This Is War. Somebody say, This Is War. This is War. And you know the recap. I really don't, I, I don't have time to go through all five weeks of the recap. If you, if you missed it, I encourage you to go back uh, on the video on YouTube or on Facebook and watch those because we've delved into a lot of things. Uh, but this week we're going to be talking about something you're very familiar with that you've probably heard preached a thousand times, and I may not bring you any new information, and again, I may tell you something you may have never heard, but this morning we're going to preach about being dressed for battle. Being dressed for battle. How many of you know that what you wear matters? What you wear matters. You would not, or at least I would, and some of you may be different than me, you would not go out and weed eat your yard in shorts and flip-flops. Hello? Because if you're clumsy like me, you're going to end up stubbing your toe or hitting yourself with the, with the wire, and you're going to really test your sanctification. <laughs> it's better to wear long pants and closed-toed shoes. Man, am I right? Am I right? Ray says, I don't know. Ray is one of those people who we need some shorts and clips. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Eddie is too. If I was to, to meet the Queen of England, I would not wear a bathrobe and house shoes. I would probably, well, I know I would wear the nicest thing that I have because what I wear in that situation matters. If I'm going to be a police officer, what I wear matters. I need to make sure that I have my bulletproof vest, that I have my utility belt, that I have my badge. If I'm going to be a firefighter, I've got to make sure that I have all of my, my, my gear ready to go. I've got to make sure I've got the fire retardant suit, the helmet, the oxygen. It, it, no matter what we're talking about, every situation requires a different uniform. And what you wear in that situation will matter. It will determine your success in whatever you are trying to do, whether it be your job, whether it be an interview, whether it be a book. It doesn't matter. What you wear matters. The same is true in our spiritual battle against the, spirit, the spiritual kingdom of darkness. What we wear is essential to our success. Because if we're not properly dressed, then therefore we are an open target to the attacks and the schemes of the devil. If we are not properly prepared to face our opponent, if we are not properly clothed in the necessary uniform then we should not be shocked when we're taken advantage of and we're attacked from every side and we have no covering. Paul talks about our covering in Ephesians chapter 6, verse, starting with verse 10. And you've heard it termed the armor of God. Start with verse 10. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Somebody said be strong. Yeah. And in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor, say whole armor, whole armor, of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor, say whole armor, whole armor. of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the uh, and sorry, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray one more time. Father, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity for, to preach to these people. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that I have this, this privilege, God, to bring the word, and I pray that you will use me as a vessel, Lord. God, let it be your words, not mine. Let it be, Father, your word and your thoughts and not mine, Father, and let these people have ears to hear and hearts to receive the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul, and all the writings of Paul are 
interesting to me because Paul had a gift about him that I wish I had. He was a master illustrator. He could take any sort of spiritual subject he was trying to explain, and he could find some sort of physical application. If you read about the, uh, the writings of Paul, he uses a lot of sports analogies, and y'all know I'm just a you know, just tremendous sportsman. But uh, he used a lot of sports analogies. He uses a lot of things that the people of his day would have been very familiar with. So the very same thing is true in his, his explanation of the armor of God. Paul was illustrating to these people something they were very familiar with. And when he uses the word armor, he's specifically talking about the, the armor of the Roman soldiers, the armor of the Roman legion. The, the, fir, the, the, the phrase whole armor actually means a full suit of armor and is it's translated as a Roman soldier who is dressed from head to toe. So when Paul says take up the whole armor of God, he's saying be fully dressed just as a Roman soldier would be dressed. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of be a little a little back and forth today because the Lord told me to preach it like that, like it comes to me. But Paul says, take up the whole armor. So the first thing you need to understand is you need to have all of it, or you better not have any of it. Y'all help me this morning. If you don't have all of it, then the whole thing is useless. You have to take up the entire armor of God because how many know it, 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 it would be ridiculous of me to stand up here in my suit, my tie, and my jacket, my shirt, and my shirt and have no pants on. You wouldn't want to see that, I promise you. My outfit is useless without the entire thing put together. The same is true for the armor of God. Paul says take up the whole armor. Put it all on because without all of it, it's useless. So we need to be sure that we take up every part that Paul's talking about. Now, the Roman soldier, and in case you're wondering, this is not a Roman soldier's armor. This is an antique. I don't know what you know what it represents, but I appreciate your savings and Larry and Gloria letting me use it. But I just thought this would gain your attention, and I know it it didn't startle a lot of you. And I wanted Harvey to help me there just to give you a physical representation. But this here would be more like what the Roman soldiers would wear. Now, the Roman soldiers' outfit had seven individual pieces that made up the entire uniform. And their code of conduct was that unless they were told otherwise, they had to have all seven pieces, otherwise they were out of dress code. So all of these seven pieces, Paul was very familiar with them because Paul spent the majority of his ministry uh, chained between two individual um, soldiers in jail cells. So he knew what this armor looked like. He was very familiar with what it was. And being a Roman soldier, the people of the feast of Ephesus would have known it as well. So Paul starts explaining. And he starts putting spiritual application to a physical, uh, a, a physical materialistic object. And he starts talking about the armor of God. And starts referencing it to the armor of the Roman soldier. Now, I'm going to bring up, first of all, one thing we sort of talked about, one thing Paul didn't specifically mention, but it's there. And the first one I want to talk about is the lance or the spear. Uh, David, you can go to the next one. This lance or this spear, um, there was three different ones. Each of them were sort of the same length, and they all had the same purpose, and they were, uh, they, they were thrown by the, uh, by the soldier to hinder and to distract the opposing army. Now, one of them was a, uh, the one here on, on y'all's left. It, it was just a plain spear, and it, it, it was just thrown in order to distract them. It was thrown at the, uh, the shields of the opposing army because if, if they stuck in the shield, it made the shields heavy to the point that the other, uh, the other army could not carry the shield. But the other one here, the one on the far right, that round ball is a weight. And they would use these weights to put on these things so that when they hit their target, whether it be a soldier or whether it be a, um, a, a shield, it would bend the tip of this, of this lance or this spear. And it would cause it to, to not be able to be removed unless the soldier himself came and took it out. Now, these weapons, they were very fierce for the Roman military. They were very effective. Uh, for their distraction of the enemy because the enemy, when they came against them, they were trying to dodge these spears. And since they were so focused on dodging the spears, it gave the Roman soldiers an upper hand. I'm going somewhere if you'll go with me. These weapons were long and they were, one was short and, uh, I'm sorry, one was thin and the other one was thick. And they had their purpose to penetrate and weaken 
the enemy forces. Now, Brother Drake, what on earth could a lance or a spear be? Well, first of all, Paul mentions one in verse 18. He said, pray always with all prayer and supplication. Prayer is a lance, it's a spear against the attacks of the enemy. How so? Because when you start praying, hello, yeah. when you start praying, even before the enemy even tries to charge you, it sends distraction into his camp. When you start to pray and you start to you start to declare the word and you start to intercede or, or you pray in the spirit, whenever you start to do that, that sends a distracting spear into the plans of the enemy because at that point he realizes he's got to start changing his whole plan because you're aware of something that he's trying to do. So you start, Paul said, pray with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Because just like the thrust of this heavy, this heavy spear would stop the progression of the enemy forces, so prayer hinders and stops the progression of Satan and his demons. Prayer is like a guided missile. It can be launched from anywhere in the world, and it hits its target every time. So first of all, we can because they had two of them that they would carry. The first one would be prayer, and the second one, and I'm not going to spend long on these because I've already talked about them in this series, would be worship. I told you before, worship is a weapon that we neglect and that we do not utilize, and because of that, we're weak in our faith. Because not only does worship, worship encourages us, but worship confuses the devil. Because the devil does not understand how can they be going through something and still worship? How can they be going through something, Sister Teresa, and still come to the altar at the church and lift their hands and say, he's a way maker, he's a miracle worker, and a promise keeper. Misty, it, it, it just, it, it just bumfuzzles him that the children of God, when he's attacking them and he's coming at them and he's throwing all this junk at them, that they can stand and say, but God. Worship is always a weapon that will send the enemy into confusion. When they used it in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat sent up Judah. And when Judah shouted a voice of praise, it said that the, uh, the opposing forces got so confused and so terrified that they started killing one another. It said in Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Simon at the midnight hour, Then it had the neck guard on the back. You can kind of see it 
right here on this slope. That was the neck guard. It's a lot like what football players have because you know that those football players, they can sometimes hit so hard that they can snap their neck. Okay. Same is true for these. They, they, they would go into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Not only was it to take force from them if they were to tackle somebody, but it was to keep somebody from coming at them and trying to chop their head off. It was to keep somebody from coming up behind them and snapping their neck and protecting the neck. The second thing, it, the third thing it had was it had a brow guard. The, you can see it kind of juts out at the front. And that's in case a, 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 the opposing enemy tried to come with an axe or something and come down on them, it protected all of this right here. Protected their eyes and their mouth and their nose. Then it had these on the side. Those were to protect the, uh, the, they were the cheek pieces, and they were to protect the cheekbones and the jaw from being injured in the case of any facial impact. Yeah. So it protected the mouth. It not only protected the head, but it protected the mouth. Yeah. I'm going to say this and move on. There's some people who claim to be saved, but their mouth said their lies. Yeah. Move on, Dre. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so the helmet protected all directions, front, back, and sides, and it was extremely durable and able to protect the head from any impact. It can handle the blow of the hardest weaponry that the enemy might have. And it was able to deflect darts and arrows away from the face and the head. It was so massive and dense that nothing could pierce it. Notice that Paul takes this wonderful helmet and likens it to salvation. Now, Amber, I don't know if you read the Bible like I do. But as soon as I see something, I start asking questions. Why? Why salvation? Ray, I want to know what was going through Paul's mind when he said that helmet is like salvation. Because to us, we're thinking, now, salvation is a spiritual experience, so how do we put a physical application onto it? What did the helmet protect? Talk to me. The brain, the mind, the head. Where do most of our spiritual battles go on? Your spiritual battles, and if you have, talk to me after, because I'd love to hear your story. Our spiritual battles are not us one-on-one -on -one battling a demon. I have never wrestled one. Don't want to. Okay? It's all here. Amen. Yes. The enemy, I told you last week, part of his his scheme is to plant stuff in your mind. Accusations, lies, slanderous thoughts. He wants to plant these things in your mind because he knows what makes you tick. That's right. He knows what proclivities you have. He knows what habits you have. He knows your bloodline. He knows what he can get you with. So therefore, he takes thoughts of that nature, whether it be lust, whether it be lies, whether it be gossip, whether it be blood, it don't matter what it is. He'll take thoughts of that nature and start planting them in your mind because here's what the enemy knows that some of us fail to realize. The mind is the control center of the body. The heart makes the blood pump. We'll get to that in a minute. But the mind is what tells everything else to make decisions. Now, we're not only talking about the brain, physical brain itself, and the way that it's wired and the chemical uh, balances. We're talking about the spiritual mind. The spiritual man. Because, see, what Satan knows, if he can get into your head, Sister Betty, then he can take your life. Yeah. If he can get into your mind and start persuading you now, and start making you believe the stuff he's telling you, then he knows he can capture you. See, I tell y'all this, and I, I confession is good for the soul. Every week, it never fails. He did it to me yesterday. He gets me with self-esteem and anxiety every time. And I'm stupid enough to entertain him some days. He tells me, Brother Gene, every Saturday, you might as well call somebody else. You ain't going to do this. He tells me Mercedes every Saturday and sometimes Sunday morning. You might as well fake sick. You're going to make a fool of yourself. And he'll get me anxious, Angel. He'll get me, yesterday, I, I'm not telling you this, he got me so overwhelmed that I honestly thought I was having a heart attack. Just, I, 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 I just, never felt like that. Just pin up, pin up. 
because he's planting. Good stuff because he knows where he can get me. If he can get my mind, Ray, then he can shift all my emotions. He can, if he can get me to convince myself that he's right, then he knows that just gives him a little more inch. That just gives him one more place to step his foot because if he can get your mind, he can take your life. The reason why we have to wear salvation as a helmet, because I've heard it said this way, the last thing to get saved is the mind. The heart and the, the spirit, all that stuff, we confess and we believe and our spirit is transformed. But what they fail to tell us sometimes is you're still going to battle mindsets, temptations, and all these other things. Because the mind is the place that if we don't keep it guarded, Satan will dump his junk in there every time. So Paul says, take your salvation and wear it as a helmet. Remind, basically what Paul is saying, remind yourself, remind yourself of what God says about you. Amen. Remind yourself that you have been saved, that you have been bought with a price, that the devil may bring up sins, he may bring up accusations, he may tell you things that you know you did, but you remind yourself of the truth of God's word that says,
That's what controls your will. That's what affects your mind. That's what controls your emotions. So what Paul's saying is you need to guard that thing out of which everything else originates. Why? Because just like our physical heart can affect the physical body, just our spiritual heart affects the spiritual body. If I don't eat right, which I don't, I don't, then eventually I'm going to have heart problems. My arteries are going to have, you know, plaque build up. My, you know, I'm going to have high blood pressure. My heart is going to start showing me signs in my physical body. Something's not right. Something's not right with the heart because my body's reflecting it. If my spiritual heart is bad, then my spiritual body will be bad. And if my spiritual body is bad, I don't belong to Christ. Because Christ, those that are righteous are those that belong to the kingdom of righteousness. Hello? We are not children of darkness, we are children of light. Paul says you have to guard that thing because if wickedness is able to get in it, just like the mind, then Satan can sway you towards the drought he wants to go. How do you think people get demon possessed? Because they left their heart unguarded. Am I making sense? That demon had grounds to get in there and take over and once it had the ability to take over, then it was able to sway everything that person does. So Paul says you have to guard the seat and the center of your emotions because just like the mind if Satan can get control of that he can get control of you Amen. and if he's controlling you you don't belong to God Amen. how do you guard that? by keeping the word y'all have to this one? the way that we guard our heart with righteousness is by getting in the book because the word tells us that the word is a lamp unto our feet Amen. and a light unto our path. When you walk right, you won't be susceptible to go the wrong way. Because the Bible will never lead you astray. Amen. It will never take you the wrong direction. It will always take you in the way of righteousness sake. And if it doesn't, you're not reading it right. We have to be careful to guide our lives and align our lives with the word, line upon line, precept upon precept, because if we allow any wrongness in our lives, we open the door for the devil. Because demons operate on wrongness. I heard this illustration this week. If I was to leave junk out on the counter, then I have invited mice and roaches into my home. I have given them something to say, well, this is an open door. When we go through wrong, you're giving the devil an open door. When we watch filth, when we entertain filth, when we talk filth, hello. That's why there are certain movies we refuse on our television because I am not about to battle a demon that I just welcomed on into my house. We got to be careful because if not, that demon will have right. Right because we were doing wrong. You got to guard your heart with righteousness, and the way you guard your heart with righteousness is by getting into the word. Y'all still trying? Is it making sense? Third thing he does the belt of truth. Now, this one is going to be a minute. Susan, you're fashionable. I saw your shoes Friday night. I think they saw them from the International Space Station. I like them. This is for sermon for this for illustration. What was the first thing you noticed about my outfit today when I saw it? First thing that's coming to mind. Cuff links. Cuff yeah. Jessica, first thing that comes to your mind when you saw my outfit. What's the first thing? The blue. The blue. Okay. Darn. <laughs> Focus 
this much on the belt, do you? Women will have the belt because it's fashionable. Yeah, y'all have belts that just serve no purpose at all but for looks. <laughs> Men, we have belts that don't matter what they look like, just give us a belt, right? Okay? Why? Because these got to stay up. Okay? I'm not, I, I don't want to be pulling and put. I'd rather have my, my oxygen cut off than be having to just pull and tug. I can't do all that. Anyway, the belt <coughs> is not important, but it's essential. The Roman belt was the same way. It was nothing fancy. It was just a leather belt with some metal plates on it. And it, 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 most Roman soldiers, they had it, they put it on, and probably thought nothing about it. I doubt any Roman soldier wrote a letter from home and said, yes, I got this new belt that I got. <laughs> they were not focused on the belt, but here's the thing. While the belt wasn't flashy, it wasn't real noticeable, the belt was essential to the armor. Why? Because the belt what held everything else together. I'm getting ahead of myself, but the belt, I'm going to use Harley again just to help. This would be where his belt was. You can't see this, but even Harley has some leather straps here, and this would be considered his belt. The belt <coughs> attached, is attached to the breastplate. That was so that the breastplate when he was running wasn't just beating against his chest. The lance that I told you about in the first, it was carried on one side. We'll get to this in a minute. The sword was carried on his, what, his dominant side, so it was easy, it, it was accessible. He had a small shield that he would keep when he was in at home in case there was, you know, he had to go and do some sort of law enforcement work. Everything that he had in some shape or form was connected to the belt. Without the belt, everything else would fall apart. The same is true with truth. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay, thank you. Taylor says drink or listen. Just shut up and preach. <laughs> Is that what you said? It is. Okay. Without truth, we will fall apart. Without truth, it doesn't matter how nice your helmet looks, how pretty your breastplate is, how wonderful your new, your new kicks are, it makes no difference because you ain't got the belt. The belt, while seemingly inessential was the core for their ability to do battle. It carried all their necessities. Truth is what carries and what all of the necessities for warfare originate from. It is no secret that we live in a society where truth is being compromised. Amen. Not even just biblical truth. Truth, period. We've got politicians that will stand in front of a camera and lie to your face and convince you they are telling the truth. We have got people who we know at work, who we know at church, yeah, they're in the church too, who we know from wherever that will stand in front of you and will lie their face off and convince you, and try to convince you and me that it's true. Because truth nowadays Truth is something that our society sees as changeable. There's this thing going around, I guess it's still popular, and people not, may not realize it, but a lot of my generation and the generation after me, they consider truth to be something that they personally believe. Life is all about personal truth to them. That means whatever they see is right is true. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. You see that with this LGBTQ, XYZ, whatever they are, agenda, telling you I was born this way. And they'll tell you that's true. And you'll have doctors that will stand behind them and say, well, there's a genetic blah, 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 bull crap, all this mess. They'll, they'll tell you all this stuff and try to convince you it's true when we know that it's not. They'll tell you, well, you know what? A child don't understand their gender, so they need to choose it. And they'll stand up there and tell you, you know, that this is true, that they need it. And we know 
For thousands of years, it worked where one thing made you a male and the other thing made you a female, and there was no question about it. But they'll tell you, oh, that's not the case anymore. And they try to take truth and act like truth is fluid and change it just so it doesn't offend them. Honey, I'm here to tell you, truth is truth whether you like it or not. Amen. I'm here to tell truth, the definition of truth is whatever God has to say of a man. Amen. It don't matter what we say. I can stand outside and tell you all day long the sky is orange, but the sky is blue. And if God said it's blue, it's blue. Mm. True is whatever God says is the truth. Whatever his word says, that's true. So when he tells me that it is wrong for a man to lie with a man and a woman to lie with a woman, I don't care how much you enjoy it, how good it feels, or what the society tells you, it's sin and it's wrong. Amen. I don't care if they tell you that you can pick your gender. The Bible says he made them male and female. He created them. There is no such thing as some non-binary alien walking around that don't know what they are. God created only two individuals. And when he said it, he meant it. And I'm here to tell somebody something. And if you get mad at me, I love you. But God is not going to change his truth just to accommodate your opinion. Come on. Amen. He's not going to do it. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanged. That's right. We have to have truth at the center of our being because if not, we'll fall for anything. Because not only is our society trying to push some false agenda, there are churches, nationwide churches, who will push this garbage of false doctrine and, and there are tons of people who are led astray by it and they're following and not realizing they're following them right to hell. Amen. We have to have truth in order to make sure we can discern right from wrong. I heard one of my one of my raised Christ, uh, wait, 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 Christian maybe, and Misty's favorite preachers, Kevin Wallace, said it this way. In the FBI, the money laundering department, in order to figure out what bills are false, they don't give them fake money, Sister Betty. The FBI does not give those people fake money. All they hand them is real money, constant, real money. To them. Because the more they feel real money, when something fake passes through their hands, they don't even have to look at it. They can say, this is not a real bill. Because they felt the real thing. They know what a real dollar bill feels like. They know the weight that it, they, they know the material. All, they don't even have to look down. They can say, this is not right. This is not the real thing. See, we have to know the truth in order to be able to discern the truth. And all the, I, the, everything today is going to hinge off you knowing the word. Everything I talk about today is going to be about the word because the word is essential. In order for us to battle falsehood, we got to know the truth. Because the Bible even says it this way. If you don't know truth, you can't be free. Yeah. For the truth shall set you free. Amen. The truth should constantly be in our minds. That guards our, mind, that guards our thoughts. It should constantly be in our heart. Because then it keeps us walking the right way. It, it should constantly be in our innermost being. It should be flowing out of our mouth all the time. It should be the intake. It should be what we ingest every day. Because if we don't. Will fall for whatever lies and deceit that the devil throws against us. Because he's a liar. He's a liar. And the only way you can combat the lies of the enemy is by knowing the truth of God's word. The belt of truth holds it all together. Without truth, we'll fall apart. We need truth to fight the enemy. The next thing, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, these things were they were bad. They were, they look real. Simple. But these shoes, and this is just a replica, they're not even close to the real thing. But these shoes, and you might even see some of them, were made of a mix of leather and metal. And they went all the way up to the back of the knee, the back calf, and that was to keep the uh, Roman soldier from getting tangled up in, in briars and things when he's walking through rough terrain. What does that tell me? That tells me that the shoes of our peace helps us from getting tangled up in the mess of the world. Amen. 
Mm-hmm. Helps us from getting tangled up in the cares of breaches and the cares of life and that hinder our walk with God. But they, they were they were they, they they protected the land. They were open at the front in order to, to make them more breathable. Now in order to help them wear them every day. But on the bottom of these shoes, that they were had a metal uh, metal plate. Maybe you know the next picture. And on that metal plate, they had uh, spikes. And those are those are smaller ones, but they're almost like cleats that football players would wear. Now the perp- these metal spikes could range. They were fitted to the soldier. The soldier got to pick how. You know, how big he wanted the spikes or whatever. They could range anywhere from a half an inch to a full inch or whatever. But the purpose of these spikes were so that when they were in battle, they could walk through rough terrain and not get tripped up. But was so that when they were in hand-to-hand combat, Holly, when their, when their enemy is pushing back, they can take these shoes and dig them down into the ground, and they are able to stand firm even when the enemy is trying to knock them down. I'm about to preach if you'll go right here with me. The shoes are the preparation of the gospel of peace. When we know the word, when we know what God's word says, when we have the gospel hidden in our hearts, when no matter what Satan comes against us and no matter what he says, he can beat us up, he can try to push us down, but we've got something, we've got a solid rock that we're able to put those cleats down into and the wind may blow, the storm may rage, but we can say, I'm not moving from here because we've got something that will keep us standing in time of trial. We've got something that will keep us standing when the devil's trying to push us away. We've got something that helps us stay on ground no matter what the enemy is pushing and throwing against us. When we know the word, we're able to have peace. And peace is what will keep you constant, even in in constant and uh, uneven times of life. Peace is not the absence of trouble, but it is tranquility in the midst of trouble. How else can I have peace when, 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 when my husband or my wife comes to me and says, I want a divorce? It's because I've got the shoes. How can I how can I stand firm? How can I stay in a walk with God when they call and tell me your house is about to be foreclosed and you ain't got any money in the bank? It's because I've got the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. What what do I do when they call me and they tell me you've got you've got a disease we don't have any cure for and we don't know what we're gonna do, but we have the peace. Of God that helps us stand firm. What do we do? How do we stand? We know the word. We know God's promises and we know they are yes. And that makes us stand no matter what is coming against us. We got the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of preparation, the gospel of peace. And we got the shield of faith. I think that's the next one. Yeah. I'm hurting y'all. This shield, I told you they had two. They carried a small round one that was about the size of that symbol up there on their side, but this was the one they took to battle. This shield was the size of a door, about that big. And it was it was shaped to be curved. And this shield was made of heavy pieces of metal, and on that heavy pieces of metal was layered layers of animal skin and animal hide and made it almost a leather-like consistency. Now, these shields serve several purposes. One, the soldiers would stand in a big line and they would hold their shields up and they would create a wall and they would push against their opponents. And that wall, as long as they worked together, hello, when they linked their shields together. They became a defense, a wall that pushed back the opposing forces. Ladies and gentlemen, when we get together and with people of like-minded faith, when we work together instead of working against one another, when we stand with each other and say, I'm going to pray for you, you pray for me. When we say we're in this together and we start pushing together, we become an unstoppable force that Satan cannot understand that Satan cannot stand against. We are able to push back the forces of darkness because we're 
in the same mind, one mind, one accord, that's how the military would push back the enemy and stay victorious. But not only that, when they were approaching a city with a wall, they would take these shields and they would put them over their head and create like a turtle shape, a turtle shell sort of shape. So that would prevent, one, somebody from throwing things from the wall and hitting them in the head. And number two, it, it would prevent them from being hit by arrows. Now, the arrows were the things they had to look out for the most. Because there were three different kinds of arrows in this time. One was just a regular plain arrow that most of you have seen. It was a hollow stick with a, uh, like an arrowhead on the end of it. And there were two others. One that was, the, the end of it was, uh, was dipped in a uh, tar-like substance. And when they would shoot it, they would light that, that end on fire. And because of the tar, it would, whatever it landed on, it would stick to it. And it would just cause a burn. That's all it would just cause smoke and a bunch of stuff. Then the third one was like a missile. It was a hollow reed. And they would take this hollow reed and they would pour petroleum down into it. And they would put the arrowhead on the end of it and also dip that in tar. And when they shot it, they would light that on fire. Because it was hollow, when it hit the shield, it would spread. Because petroleum is like gasoline. Because the, the, the hollow reed would break, releasing the petroleum, and it would take that fire and it would spread. And it would almost consume the shield. These arrows represent attacks and temptations of the devil. The first one, the plain one, is just common temptation. The Bible says that, 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 with that uh, uh, such temptations such as common to man is what first Corinthians is. All of us, because we're human, we are all tempted to do wrong. Okay? The second one, the one that was dipped in tar, is what um, some would call a fiery trial. Okay? Uh, a testing of your faith. A testing like what Job went through, where it, it may be prolonged. It, it's, to, it's to try to prevent you, it's to try to weaken your faith. Yeah. The third one, though, it, both of those combined, but it's something that the enemy throws at you. And one, one commentator said it like this, it's a burning temptation or a burning desire that you cannot get out of your mind. One explanation I have for that, I think it's in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, David's son Ammon, it said that he desired his half-sister Tamar so much to the point that he made himself sick over her. He was less than that. He had such an intense burning desire for her that he tricked her, got her into, pretended he was sick, got her into the bedroom, raped her, and then hated her because he acted on his own temptation. I already know the Bible is that explicit. Yeah. That's a burning design. That's a burning temptation. Something that the enemy throws at you that is so overwhelming, so consuming, that you just almost feel like, I've got to do it or I'm going to go crazy. Yeah. You ever been there? Mm -hmm. How do we guard against this? The shield of faith. How is faith like a shield? Well, Faith. Without faith, no man can please God. So therefore, without faith, God won't act in your situation. My faith in the fact that God is my protector, my faith in the fact that I am a blood-bought son of the Most High King, my faith in the fact that although I'm facing a trial, I'm going to be delivered, my faith and who I serve is my preventative measure against those attacks because it reminds me I don't have to give in to it. Does that make sense? But you can't just have any old faith. You don't have to have necessarily great faith, but you've got to have faith that is anointed by the word and the oil of the spirit. Because let me tell you something, dry, dead, routine faith does not scare the devil. Sunday only, Sunday morning only faith does not, it does not affect him. Routine religion does not even get on his radar because it does nothing against him. It is not even close 
just such as infant Bible, but anointed faith. Amen. Amen. Faith anointed by the Spirit Amen. and by the water of the Word. Because you see, because these shields were leather and were animal hides, they had the potential, Holly, to become dry. They were in desert-like areas. And in order to keep them pliable and from cracking, and in order to keep them from being consumed by the fire of the darts, they carried around a bottle of oil with them. And every day, Sister Teresa, they'd sit there and they'd massage the oil into that shield because they kept it soft and they kept it supple. And before they would go into, into battle, they would find a creek or they would have water and they dip that shield down in that water and that would keep it moisturized. And that would keep it so that even if a fiery dart came against it, it would not consume it, but it would extinguish the fiery darts of the devil. What did, what did Paul say? Take up the shield of faith so that you are able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy. That tells me that every day I have to make sure that I've got the Holy Ghost with me and that I have washed my faith in the water of the Word. That tells me every day I need to make sure I have spent time in prayer and I have asked the Spirit to anoint me and to go with me and that I have taken in the, the refreshment of the Word and kept my faith active and kept it pliable and kept it Get, kept it moisturized so that no matter what attack that Satan throws against me, it will have no effect. Amen. We're to take up the shield of faith. Take up, in the Greek, actually means to take up by choice. It doesn't just happen automatically. You take it up by choice. See, your reaction to every situation will determine where your faith is. How do you respond when things start happening? Do you run to the, wor the world or do you run to the word? Yeah. Do you run to God or do you run to your own resources? You run to your own resources, you'll be consumed every time. Mm -hmm. But you run to God. You run to prayer. You run to the spiritual things and you hold up that shield, I promise you, no matter how fiery that dart is, you will extinguish it. Then you've got the sword of the Spirit, which you know is the Word of God. A double-edged sword. Hebrews 4 tells us it's sharper than a double-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not only is it something, as we've talked about before, a surgical tool on our heart where God reveals things to us that we need to get out of our lives, but it is a, it is a defensive, often offensive weapon against the devil so that when he attacks us, we've got something in our spiritual armor to attack him back with. Jesus in the wilderness. I know I reference this every week, but I'm sorry. It just gets me happy every time. When he comes against him and he says, if you be the son of God, do this. If you be the son of God, do this. If you be the son of God, do this. Jesus didn't counter back and go, all right, Satan, I'll do it. He hid behind his shield of faith and he said, it is written. And every time he said, it is written, that sword come from out behind that shield and it jabbed the devil. And every time he said it is written Jesus thrust that sword deeper and deeper into the enemy and he started knocking him back he started pushing him back every time Satan come against him Jesus come at him with the word every time the devil comes at you it don't matter what he says you better come back with the word because when you come back with the word he has no ground to stand upon Amen. he cannot he cannot stand against the word of God because truth will always, always outweigh a lie. We've got to have the sword of the Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, I preached it like it come to me. I could have gone so many different directions, but we've spent weeks on it. I didn't have time. But every day, you need to make sure you are totally guarded in every bit of this. I've heard different preachers say it's not for everyday wear. I respect them, but I don't agree with them. Because I know it every day. I don't need it just for tough situations. Those come, those, those are going to come. So I'm just going to wear the armor and be prepared. But how? How do I put on something I cannot see? How do I put on something spiritual? Paul said, put on the whole armor. The word put on literally means to 
get dressed in good clothes. Now, I know Taylor had this privilege this morning, but I did not have the privilege of Taylor laying me down on the bed and dressing me. Y'all didn't laugh like I told you. Xander got that privilege. Xander got to be dressed by Jessica. He didn't have to pick out his outfit. He didn't have to worry about getting up. But he just, she got him dressed. He, he didn't have to put forth little or no effort to get dressed. Me, on the other hand, I had to go to the closet, pick out something. I started to make sure this match this because I'm colorblind. And, you know, I, I had to put forth my effort. I had to put on my socks. I had to put forth all this work to get dressed this morning. The same is true for the armor of God. It don't just happen. You don't just wake up every morning. I don't care if you've been saved 50 years and speak in tongues five hours a day. It ain't just going to come on you. You've got to choose to take it. You've got to choose to say every morning, and I do this, Lord, guard me. Guard me with the helmet of salvation and remind me who I am in you. Guard my mind from wicked thoughts. Lord, cover me in the breastplate of righteousness so that my heart is pure and holy before you and not affected by the things of this world. Lord, cover my, my waist with the belt of truth so that everything I do is centered around truth, that there's no falsehood found in me, that there's no lies, there's no deceit found in my being. Lord, help me to put on the shoes of peace and manufacture peace everywhere I go. Help me to stand when the devil comes against me. Lord, help me to take up this faith and guard against the enemy and take up the sword, which is the word. Every day you have to make the decision to put it on. And the only way you can put it on is by spending time with the Lord. Amen. It's called the armor of God. Yeah. That word, that phrase of God literally means armor that comes from God. Yeah. He's the only one that can give it to you. The only way you're going to get dressed in that armor is by every day coming before him and saying, Lord, help me put this on today. Lord, cover my mind with the word. Cover me with your truth. Misty, I'm almost done with your ready. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, and this has been the entire thing about it, and I pray I have done this justice. And I have made sense, because that's my prayer. Lord, help me to equip the saints. Help me to let, let this make sense to them. <coughs> because you are a target. Your children are targets. And if we're not prepared, then we are not going to successfully overcome the schemes and the wiles and the deceit of the devil. Yes, we are victorious. I told you two or three weeks ago, we do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. Okay? The, our salvation has already been bought. We know we're going to heaven. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming back. But we still have to face things here on this earth. Jesus said he died to give us life. And what? Life more Our life will be summed up entirely in heaven, but the abundant life is what happens here. And you can't have abundant life if you're consistently defeated, miserable, down and out, woe is me, gloom, despair, agony on me. You, that's not an abundant life. That's a miserable life. And Jesus did not sacrifice to give us a miserable life. Hello? Not only in our new 
our new body, our new creation, but in the fact that we are victorious, that we are more than conquerors, then he'll take advantage of that and he'll start attacking your heart and trying to draw you back to those things you used to do. He'll start trying to take your personal truth and say, well, you know, that's not all that bad. They tell you it is, but am I making sense? We hurt ourselves by not helping ourselves. And by not helping ourselves, when we avoid prayer time, when we neglect to spend time in the Word, because we're too busy, because we, 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 we just, you know, we've got all this going on. When we neglect that intimate relationship with God, we choose to walk away from the very source of our strength and power. Faith can move mountains, but anointed faith can make devils flee. And the only way you're going to keep yourself anointed and equipped and strong in the Lord and standing fast is every day saying, Lord, I'm setting an appointment with you. I told you, I gave you all a Bible, the church did a Bible and a highlighter. Have you been using it? If not, that's a good indication you have not been walking in the honor of God. Hello? If you ain't reading your scripture every day, you are choosing to let the devil come and attack you because you have nothing to stand on. Ladies and gentlemen, in order for us to be the victors, to be the warriors, to win, to overcome in this battle, we got to be equipped. And our equipment comes only from God and God alone. The way we're going to get that equipment is by getting serious about our relationship with him. Are you as serious about your relationship with him as you are Saturday night football? Are you as serious about him as you are your relationship with Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, soap operas, Netflix, Hulu, whatever you want, whatever you do? Are you as serious about him as you are that? If not, 